Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Travis Zepia. Travis, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We have connected a bit on social. We've gone back and forth a bit, but this is the first time we've been able to, to chat in person. So tell me a bit about your story. Tell me a bit about how you got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Travis Zapia. I live in Orlando, Florida. I'm 29 years old. Started on my real estate journey um, in 2016. I had just gotten a promotion at my W-2 job and was going to be moving from Pennsylvania down to Orlando. Um, at that point, I had started getting down the rabbit hole of um, real estate and investing and not working for somebody else for the rest of my life. So I knew I didn't want to rent anymore at that point in my life. So um, when I made the move down to Orlando, I decided to purchase a home rather than renting, which is what I was doing up in Pennsylvania. Um, about three months after I, I purchased a home, I ended up starting to house hack um, where I was renting out by the bedroom um, in the house that I that I had purchased. When I originally bought the house, I had no intention to, to do that. But um, once I started house hacking, then I continued to go down further rabbit holes of like, hey, if I continue to look at real estate investing as my vehicle for reaching financial independence um, and not having to work for somebody else for the rest of my life, how would I go about doing that? Uh, and what I started to realize that when I started to do research on cash flow and what cash flow I need to be able to, to become financially free. Um, what I was able to find was um, short-term rental uh, real estate investing was a vehicle that can kind of supercharge your cash flow if you purchase the right properties in the right areas. Um, and uh, another thing at that time that I, when I started to do research was the Orlando market around Disney World and, and Universal was uh, a really, really hot market for short-term rental. Two of the top 10 cities in the country um, were in Davenport and Kissimmee, so essentially right around Disney World if you're not familiar with the Orlando market. Um, and then I bought my first true short-term dedicated uh, property in 2019. Um, bought two more in 2020 and then bought two more uh, in 2021. So at this point in, in my kind of uh, my, my journey through short term rental investing, um, I, I'll net $110,000 this year from the five properties that I have. Uh, and then I also have started like a management business that uh, will end up netting around sixty to $70,000 next year if I don't add any additional properties. I want to talk a bit about why specifically real estate. Before we do, you mentioned the numbers you're going to net, and we can dive into that a little bit later too. But when you're making so much money from your Airbnbs on a net basis, why even continue to work? I know you still have a W-2 job, so why still work? Yeah, it's the it's the constant thing I battle with every single day. Um, the reality right now is why I'm continuing to work is so I can still qualify for a loan um, under my personal name. Um, I'm fortunate in the W-2 job that I have where my debt to income can still qualify me to obtain additional loans under my personal name without having to do any creative financing or partnerships or anything like that. So for at least the, the time being, and, and probably for, um, I'm thinking probably for another 12 months, uh, maybe 18 months, I'm still going to continue to work the W-2. So I can um, obtain additional loans under my own name um, because a lot of people don't understand once you leave your W-2, qualifying for loans is going to be extremely, extremely difficult. So you have to be really, really careful and, and have a, a very solid plan um, before you officially leave and, and quit that W-2. You mentioned that you got into real estate because you were looking for ways to build cash flow so you didn't have to rely on on somebody else for your whole life. So why why real estate though? I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could do that. I think a lot of people have that same goal. Some people in the fire movement go to stock market investing, just trying to save as much as they can, then follow like a 4% withdrawal rule or something like that. So why specifically real estate? Yeah, great question. So um, it was actually because uh, when I when I started to read the book, uh, or like what led me down the path originally was reading Rich Dad Poor Dad. And after I read that book, I was like, okay, um, how do I try to figure out how to do this in the most optimized way? I started doing a bunch of just Google research of financial independence, how to do it, what to do. Um, and what I started to find was um, the industry that created the most millionaires was real estate. 
And that's what led me down the rabbit hole of finding bigger pockets, listening to the podcast that they have, starting to read and educate myself on books. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with stock market investing. I like, I do that in, in like super basic, like BTSAX index funds that track S and P, whatever. But the challenge with that is the amount of money that you have to have invested to be able to hit a financial independence number or a cash flow number from dividends and, and things like that, or the, the 4% withdrawal rate is like what I was saying before, you have to have so much money invested in order to hit whatever that number is. Um, and with five properties and like, I, I think like my total down payments on my short-term rental portfolio right now is, I think it's worth around $260,000 to generate $110,000 cash flow. Now that didn't happen overnight, but like over, over the course of four years, I was able to get there and save all that money for down payments. But that same $260,000 invested in the market wouldn't even produce I don't know the exact number, but I would assume it wouldn't even produce like $3,000 a month in, in dividends payouts. So you would have to have $1.5, $2 million invested uh, in some sort of dividend paying or understanding that you're going to withdraw that down to, to be able to pay for your expenses. So the, the return on investment, just from a time standpoint of how long it would take to save and invest. $1.5 million, $2 million could be a lifetime. But the amount of time that it would take to save and invest $250,000 with like what I'm doing is a couple of years. Um, so that was the big reason why I decided to go down the, the real estate route versus the, uh, the stock market route. But, I, but I'm also investing in stocks and, and those types of things as well on the side. Yeah, I have a, a very similar approach. When I got into real estate, I was solely a stock market investor. I believe so heavily in it and I still do. But then I had this realization when I got into real estate that let's just say you buy a rental property for $20,000 and it's a hundred thousand dollar rental property. So now let's just say you do that 10 times, which is not unrealistic, but for simplicity, let's just say at in 20 years, when those houses are all paid off, you have a million dollars in equity and you only put 20,000 times five. So you put a hundred thousand dollars in and you got a million dollars back at the end. And now 20 years, 30 years, when you want to retire, if you're thinking about it that way, like a normal stock investor would, now you have a million dollars in equity, essentially 900,000 in equity that you didn't even pay for that somebody else did. And it's very unlikely that you're going to turn hundred thousand dollars into a million in that same time period in the stock market. You know, it's possible, but it's unlikely, especially if you're going through index funds, which is a good road to go. But it's just this, when I had that mind shift that I could do that. It was just like real estate is the answer. And of course, there's a lot more work to it. It's not as passive, et cetera. And there's a lot of things that, you know, variables to consider. But when you think about that dynamic of you put maybe a hundred thousand in and you have you're pretty much set for retirement, that's that's powerful. Yeah, I think a lot of people um a lot of people look at leverage and like debt the wrong way. And and I, I know like we agree on on this and it really plays into the point that you're making is, is like the whole point of real estate investing is you're able to leverage other people's money with a small amount of money to put in to be able to buy something that is um, significantly worth significantly more than what you put into it without leveraging uh, and, and doing some really, really risky things on the, in the stock market from leveraging your portfolio and, and like increasing the risk significantly. You're not able to even come close to to the amount of money that you would be able to uh, to make, um, and, and like you're saying, you're paying off the principal over time. Yes, you're paying interest over the course of the loans, but that interest is actually making you money, even though it's, it's costing you money, but it's making you more money than it's costing you. Hopefully, if you're doing it the right way. So there's just so many benefits, plus the tax benefits and depreciation, appreciation, all that, all that fun stuff. And I didn't even mention the cash flow that you get every month, right? So you have that million dollars in equity in 20, 30 years when everything's paid off, but you're getting a couple thousand dollars a month probably in cash flow all along Absolutely. the way. That's another benefit too. What are some of the misconceptions around Airbnb? It seems to me, maybe it's just because I'm getting more into the space. You know, it's kind of that like, dynamic where like you get a new car and you've never seen that car on the road before, but you get that car and now you see it everywhere. I don't know if it's the same thing happening for me with Airbnb because I'm kind of getting into the space. Now I'm seeing how popular it is, or maybe it really is just getting super popular, but with it getting so popular, or at least seeming that way to me, what are some of the misconceptions about Airbnb that people have? 
So one of the biggest ones is thinking that um, any property is a good short-term rental property. Um, that is uh, a, a very much not true statement. Um, it's so important that you have the right property in the right location with um, a county that is short-term rental friendly. Because um, if you don't do the research that you need to do up front, you could very well be operating a property illegally and um, end up having some, some bad things happen um, with the county and, and things like that. So I think one of the, the biggest ones is like a lot of people say, hey, I want to buy in this market. And they'll reach out to me and say, hey, I want to buy in this market. Um, do you think it'd be a good short-term rental property? I'm like, uh I looked at that market. There's no Airbnbs there. That's probably a major red flag that it's not a good market and it's probably not short-term rental friendly. So every property isn't going to be a cash flowing property. Every property isn't going to be a legal property. Um, and every location isn't necessarily going to be a good location for Airbnb. There's certain areas and certain markets where they're so seasonal that they're honestly not good investments because you maybe have two or three months during the summer where every like everything's really really good and cat and like gross income is massive, but then you have to to weather a eight month nine month down season where you're maybe getting like twenty percent occupancy ten percent occupancy these one or two night bookings that that aren't really going to uh, to drive revenue so you're not able to sustain throughout the course of the year uh, and be able to cash flow um, so like that's that's one of the the big misconceptions uh, another misconception that a lot of people have is that it's a passive investment like you can set up a lot of systems and processes to streamline and do a lot of the guest communication do the dynamic pricing message your cleaners when new bookings are are made so they know when they need to go clean. A lot of that can be automated and set up in the back end from a process standpoint. And then if you have the right smart devices from a smart lock, thermostat, those types of those types of things. But short term rentals are not passive. It does take some time. Once you have like the right systems and processes in place, I truly believe in like what I see with with my portfolio right now, I'm managing six properties. I'm normally taking between 15 to 30 minutes a week per property. And that's commonly going to be answering one-off questions from guests. If I need to coordinate anything with a maintenance guy or, or my cleaners uh, for like replacing any items, buying those things and sending it to their addresses um, and, and things of that nature. But anybody that tells you it's a passive investment is lying uh, because it is, and it's, it's a lot more active than long-term rentals. Um, but you're in the hospitality industry. Once you go into short-term rental investing, you have to understand that like you are entering the hot, the the hospitality industry, and and if you don't want to do that, then short-term rental investing just just frankly isn't um, isn't for you. So I would say like those are probably two of the biggest misconceptions um, with with short-term rentals. What are some of the maybe not misconceptions but negative pieces of Airbnb? One of the biggest things that's kind of a negative is. Uh, dealing with the guests that are going to be uh, difficult to deal with. Like if you do this and you're in this business long enough, that's going to happen no matter what. You're going to have guests that are going to cause problems. You're going to have guests that are going to complain and nitpick about small things. If you take that stuff personally, then then you're going to have a really, really bad experience with short-term rentals and and managing your own short-term rental. Um, so I'd say that's probably the the biggest thing is is um, you're going to have bad guests. That's part of the business. I always try to learn from the experience of like, okay, could I have seen this and caught this when I was doing my screening process on the front end to try to make sure that I'm not um, accepting these guests in the future? And if not, um, then uh, the question really becomes, okay, are they giving legitimate feedback that I need to get fixed? Because your your guests are going to give you the the most honest and and um, and really straightforward feedback of of anybody. So like if there's things that they're calling out that are legitimate problems, like you need to you need to address those issues so that um, your other guests and your future guests aren't going to have those same problems. So I think that's probably the biggest downside is just like it's it's a pain to deal with some of these guests, but. What I would say is the like the from a percentage standpoint of the guests that I host, I would say that this is like one to two percent of the guests that I host um, over the course of a year 
that I have problems with. Um, sometimes like the issue or whatever that you deal with, it, like it makes it feel like it's a lot more than that just because like, it's like a pain in the butt to, to talk to them and communicate with them. But the reality of the situation is it's going to happen. You're going to have guests that um, nitpick or, or just complain about things. Be respectful, uh, communicate with them just like you would communicate with anybody else. Don't say anything harsh or, or rash. And if you do so and you go into it knowing that like, hey, this is, this is going to happen, um, then that's, that's just part of the business. I want to spend some time talking about how to pick markets. You mentioned that not every property, not every market is going to be good. So, and I know a lot of people on the podcast reach out to me about how I pick markets for long distance investing. So I'd love to talk a bit about how you pick markets for short-term rentals. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a really good question because it's, uh, it's one of the ones that, especially even with COVID in 2020, um, it, a lot of markets that were quote unquote hot short short terminal markets um, ended up getting hit really really hard because a lot of people weren't going into these big cities and and staying in in areas like that. So there's a couple things that I look at for markets that I'm in specifically. So first I'll I'll say like what markets I'm in. Um, I'm in uh, Kissimmee, which is uh, I'm in Kissimmee, which is by Disney World. I'm in the Smoky Mountains uh, in Tennessee, in Pigeon Forge, Sevierville area. And then um, I'm also in um, Panama City Beach. I don't own the property in Panama City Beach, but I manage for a friend's family. And each of those markets is a little bit unique. Um, but what I look for in a short-term rental market is a market that's tried and true. So it, it's been around for a significant amount of time with um, short-term rentals. The Smoky Mountains have been around for like 35, 40 years when like cabins started to be a really, really big thing. Airbnb hasn't been around and, and like the, the like how we know short term rentals now hasn't necessarily been around for that long. But but that experience and, and people going into the Smokies has, has been there for a significant amount of time. Um, it's a drive to destination, which is another big thing when, when COVID hit. A lot of the drive to destinations um, Exploded tenfold because people weren't wanting to get on airplanes. So I think having a destination that's a drive-to destination is, is something that is uh, is great. The Smokies is great because it's very centrally located on the East Coast. So people from the Northeast can drive, people from the Southeast can drive. And if you look at the population in the U.S., I think it's like 60% of the U.S. population lives on the East Coast. So up and down the East Coast. So, you, so the amount of people that could potentially go to your property are, are very, very vast. So a drive-to destination something that is tried and true from a short terminal market standpoint, and it's been around for a, for a long time. Um, and then the other thing is it has to be short term rental friendly. And when I say that, I mean, there has to be rules, laws, regulations by the county um, and or city um, that regulate short term rentals. If you're going into a market that doesn't have um, any any county restrictions or or like hey you have to have these licenses or you have to remit taxes back to the county every single month if that if that doesn't exist in the county that's an immediate red flag to me because if they don't have short term rental laws already in place then there's a significant chance that um, at any point they can enact laws that could shut your short term rental down entirely. And that's the last thing that you want to do is buy a property thinking that you're going to do something. You do it for a year, it's successful. And then all of a sudden you have neighbors or whatever that start complaining about the transient occupancy of your unit. And then um, they go reach out to the city council or, or whatever and, and start complaining. And then all of a sudden there's laws and rules and restrictions that come down uh, banning short term rental properties for your specific area. So I think those are... Um, those are really the, the three things that, um, that I'm looking for. I was just doing some reading the other day that a, a big short-term rental area that people like to vacation a lot is Hilton Head. And I just heard that they were having some issues there. And then I've also heard there were some issues in Virginia Beach with regulation. Uh, so yeah, in every, um, every area is like, if they don't have laws in place, every area is constantly changing. So the Hilton Head I hadn't heard of. You said Virginia Beach was another one. Uh, the, the only one I've heard of recently is uh, Yucca Valley in Joshua Tree, um, where like they put a moratorium where they stopped short-term rentals, um, and you couldn't apply for a license 
and it's like this like five month moratorium. So you have all these people um, that that essentially bought properties or, or were in escrow. And all of a sudden they find out from Yucca Valley and they start having all these city council meetings. There's like hundreds of people on these city council meetings freaking out that are all short terminal investors. Um, and it's crazy. Even more specifically, one of the things, you know, it it's, has to do with regulation, but it's not even necessarily at the county level, but what, how do you deal with like HOAs? So I've looked at purchasing in Florida and I've thought about buying condos in vacation areas in Florida. And my concern is that the HOA is going to have the same problem that you mentioned with the counties, right? They're going to either change their mind. They're not going to allow short-term rentals, whatever they, whatever they decide. Like, how do you deal with things like that? Do you just avoid it altogether or how do you approach it? Yeah. Uh, really good question. So I've never actually heard of HOAs um, until I moved to Florida because Texas where I lived, like they didn't really exist. Um, but the HOA is a homeowner association and it's essentially um, like you have people within the community that come together, you have a board and they make rules, regulations and, and like guidelines that you have to abide by. Um, so the um, in Florida, especially in Kissimmee, Davenport area where I'm buying, um, that uh, the, have the two properties down there. Those properties both have HOAs. But the unique thing about that area is that the communities that I'm buying in were designed for short-term rentals. So all of the units in those communities are all short-term rentals. So I'm not really concerned or worried about the laws, rules, or regulations of that community because it's literally designed for short-term rentals. And that's very, very common for um, a lot of the the neighborhoods in Kissimmee Davenport area, so that's that's like super common and, and something that shouldn't be a red flag. Now, once you start getting out of the the areas and the pockets where the communities are designed for short term rentals, and all this all of a sudden the percentage of um, people who live there full time versus the the percentage of investors who are renting their place out goes from like a ninety ten people uh, investors to homeowners to the opposite where like 10% of the properties are being short-term rent, 90% are homeowners. That's when you start to have a lot of issues and potential problems. So you want to be very, very careful and make sure that you're able to, um, you, you want to be very careful and make sure that you understand, is this community designed for short-term rentals or is this community um, something that um, has the HOA, but the majority of people are living there full-time? If the majority of people are living there full time, I would say stay clear of it because there's a significant chance over some period of time, um, there's a significantly higher chance that somebody's going to complain. And um, then they all of a sudden, the HOA might go to vote on putting in minimum lease restrictions that are three, six months, whatever. Like I've had um, properties where uh, the minimum lease requirement was uh, three to six months. So like you couldn't short term you you couldn't legally short term rent again shouldn't ever do anything illegal but like you couldn't legally short term rent and it's common that HOAs have a, a clause in their um, bylaws that essentially state you you cannot your your minimum uh, lease requirement for this property is whatever it is so understanding those restrictions understanding how friendly it is um, that HOA how friendly it is and how many people that own in that community live there full time versus our investors and, and have short term rentals there are really, really important. Are you not worried about all of the competition that comes with investing in a community that has so many short term rentals? I actually love competition because I know I'm going to be able to outperform them um, from the systems processes and the experience that I create for my guests. So, um, and the, the, like I have each of my properties has like a uniqueness to it that the other properties don't. Now, whether that's like the core and inside of the property, what it looks like, the smart TVs and things that I have inside, the amenities that I have inside my property specifically, whether it's a pool with a lanai and nice outdoor seating area or things of that nature. So I actually love competition. And, and I think competition is, is a really, really positive thing because my thought is... I I feel confident that I can outperform anybody else in there or that your traditional like mom and pop um, investors or whatever, that maybe this is just a true vacation home where they come to once or twice a year. So I, I actually really, really enjoy having competition um, in the specific area that I'm in. 
So we've talked about what to look for, but how do we actually do this? Like tactically, how do we begin our search, right? The U.S. is a huge area. How do we narrow that down? Are there any specific tools, resources, anything that you look for to find a specific market? And then once you find that market, what tools and resources are you using to find the laws and regulations for the county? And then if there's an HOA, how do you find out that stuff? Yeah. So um, the first thing that I always do for anybody that is interested in short-term rental investing is I ask them, Hey, have you ever vacationed to a spot that like you really enjoy going to every year, every other year, multiple times a year, whatever that might be. Um, Because one of the benefits of owning short-term rental is you can go use the property and, and uh, you can pick whatever dates you want. And, uh, and you would be able to go live in the property, stay in the property for a week or a weekend. So that's the first thing I ask anybody is like, okay, do you have a location or a couple locations that you enjoy vacationing at? And then the second thing is, okay, now start looking at county restrictions for that area to understand, can you short-term rent or can you not? If it's a market that you go to where you're already like renting an Airbnb, it's probably like a solid bet that it, it is short-term rental friendly, but you still want to make sure that you do the research for county restrictions specifically on what their laws are for short-term rental investors. Most counties are gonna require some sort of license. So all of my properties require a license. Some counties require a license and remitting taxes back to the county every single month. So I have, uh, I have three, yeah, three of my properties that require me re- remitting. That's the, the first thing that, that I would do and, and really, really look at. The second thing that's very, very confusing and hard for um, hard for people to understand when looking at a short term rental specifically is how do I determine like how much it's going to cash flow or how much my gross income potential is going to be for the particular property? Long term rentals are very straightforward to analyze. You can go to websites like Rentometer and, and whatnot, and you can say, okay, a two bedroom in this area, what's it going to rent for? And you can you can say with fair confidence that like it's going to rent for eleven hundred dollars a month, whatever it might be. The cool thing about short term rentals and the scary thing for a lot of people is not knowing like every month is different. You never know what your income's potentially going to be for that particular month, and that's scary for a lot of people because if you don't know and like you're taking a big risk. Like at the end of the day, you're taking a risk and, and hoping that you you analyze the property correctly. So I use something to analyze properties. I use something called um, the market dashboards from Price Labs. So the two most commonly used uh, platforms uh, before market dashboards were AirDNA and MashVisor. Those were the two most commonly known um, that short-term rental investors and people that wanted to get into short-term rental investing used. Um, the problem with those sites is they're very inaccurate from what I've seen when I start to really drill into the data and and like look at what numbers they're pulling back from different properties. Price Labs created this market dashboard like four or five months ago. And essentially, their, so Price Labs was originally designed to do dynamic pricing for units. So you can essentially put in inputs for your, your listing, connect your listing to Airbnb, say my min, medium, max price for different seasons is this. And then Price Labs takes uh, that data and dynamically prices your every single night on your calendar based off of demand, based off of how, how many people are searching for that for that area um, on each individual day. So it understands um, it, it understands holidays, seasonality, all that like weekends, weekdays, all that kind of stuff. What Price Labs was able to do is because they were dynamically pricing all of that and because they also understood when, when units got booked at what prices, they were able to aggregate all of that data and create this market dashboard that would be able to essentially tell you Hey, if you have a two bedroom property in this, it, it can show you the last 15 months, the occupancy rate every single day for all two bedroom properties in that market. Um, and it can also show you the 25th, 50th and 75th percentile for booked nights on, on what that would be for daily nightly rates. And you're able to use those two things to be able to figure out every single month, what is your potential gross income um, for the property? That doesn't include your um, mortgage, utilities, internet, uh, HOA, tax insurance, all that kind of stuff. You still have to plug that in to figure out what your cash flow would end up being and what cash on cash returns would, would look like. But 
um, using that information, which is extremely accurate uh, based off of what Price Labs was originally designed to do, um, you're able to uh, to do that and um, and have a very very good understanding of what gross income potential would look like. Hey everyone, Clay Fink here, host of the Millennial Investing Podcast. Today I wanted to tell you guys about this exciting new investment tool called Titan. Titan is an investment platform for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experienced analysts. With how hectic life can get at times, why not outsource your investments to the experts? They offer three equity portfolios and America's very first actively managed crypto portfolio. Their funds have continually beaten the market since inception, and they aim to grow your investments by 15 percent annually. At this rate, this would imply your money doubling every five years. My favorite fund is their flagship fund, which invests in the highest quality large cap growth stocks in the U.S. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you sign up through our link, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. And you're doing this upfront before you purchase the property? 100%. Yeah. So essentially what I do is I am looking at... Um, so once I narrow down a market that's short terminal friendly, and I'm like, okay, I want to buy in this market. Then I run the numbers for a two bedroom, a three bedroom, and a four bedroom. Uh, if I want to go five, like I'll run the numbers for five, but I'll purchase the data for that market. And then I'll run two, three, four, five bedroom and like see what cash flow numbers or see what gross income potential numbers look like. And then start looking at what the cost for properties in that area are for two, three, and four bedroom. Start putting in some assumptions for uh, PIPI, um, utilities, HOA, all that kind of stuff. And then start to understand like, is this market something that I would want to invest in? Or is it something that um, just isn't going to cash flow? So that's kind of like my step-by-step process of like figuring out and, and choosing a market uh, saying, okay, this is the market I want to analyze, analyzing the gross income potential of the market, and then looking at um, price points for properties in that market to then plug in the numbers to see what my um, gross income minus all my expenses are going to be and what my cash flow and cash on cash returns are going to look like. Which benchmarks are you looking at for your returns and, and what do you require for those returns to be satisfactory? Yeah, so I'm looking to hit 36% cash on cash return. So like that's like the minimum target that I'm looking to hit with running my numbers conservatively for all of my properties. So I put a little bit extra for CapEx. I put a little bit extra for miscellaneous expenses every single month of things that are going to pop up. And um, 36% minimum cash on cash return is is essentially what I'm looking for. Uh, And that's cash to close plus the the money up front to get the property ready. So usually depending on if it was a short term rental before or not, most of the markets I'm buying in are fully furnished. So the upfront cost, like I'm only doing th- like replacing things that need to get replaced. And then I'm doing like the core and, and like paint updates and those types of things inside. So generally speaking, uh, additional cash on top to get the property ready is going to be anywhere uh, between seven to ten thousand dollars. And then that's essentially the number I'm using for total cash invested into the deal. And then take cash flow for projected cash flow divided by total cash invested in the deal. Um, and I'm looking for that number to be over 36%. Since your properties are mostly furnished already, are you buying from previously owned short term rental owners? Yeah, it's another, it, it's actually another way. Um, I talked to somebody about this a while ago. It's another way to identify short term rental friendly markets. If people are selling properties fully furnished, usually it's somebody that was using it as a short term rental or a vacation home. Um, and all the markets that I'm buying in, I'm, I'm buying these properties fully furnished. Generally, why that happens is because investors don't want to like move all that crap out. Usually they're maybe not in the market or they're long, they're long distance or things like that. So it's one of those things where I'm buying all my properties fully furnished and then just replacing uh, the stuff that is just like old, ugly, and, and not going not, not gonna to be like good for, for guest experience. I was, 
I'm in a couple of Facebook groups for short-term rentals. And I saw a post the other day that some, a couple of people were saying they spent upwards of $50,000 to furnish some of their short-term rentals. And I was absolutely shocked by that because like every, I mean, I house hack every, pretty much all of my properties and I buy all my furniture, like secondhand. Like I don't have a very nice furniture or anything. So so here people are spending like almost $50,000 to furnish a short-term rental on top of, you know, down payments and everything else that goes into cash required to close. I was amazed. And you kind of avoid that by buying fully furnished or? Yeah. I've only bought fully furnished. Um, and I've only bought fully furnished that doesn't need like a significant update for the furniture specifically. There's a couple of reasons why, but one of the biggest reasons why right now is because, because of all the supply chain issues from COVID, you, if you're going to go furnish a property right now, you have to hope that it's in stock and like you can get it delivered today. Cause I've heard like horror stories of people saying, Oh, I wanted this couch. This couch isn't going to deliver for three months. Well, I'm not waiting to get my property ready. Like I want to like get the property ready to go. And usually my properties take about seven days to get set up from the time I get there to like me leaving and having that first guest check in. So it, furnishing is very, very difficult in, in today's market. Hopefully it gets easier um, here in the next six, 12 months. So I haven't, I haven't taken on any massive project like that. I will in the future at some point. Like I know, I, I know I will, but I'm just not willing to take that, um, not necessarily risk, but I'm not willing to take on that additional work in today's market, just with all the supply chain issues of, of uh, everything being out of stock. I hear from a lot of investors that come on the podcast that they're buying properties from other investors. And I'm always intrigued by that because I'm like, well, that investor is selling that property for a reason. Like they weren't successful with it. So what makes you think that you could be? And, you know, obviously there's many, many reasons why somebody's selling a property. It, maybe, maybe it was super successful and they just want to sell it anyway. And that could be great, but maybe, maybe they weren't successful and that's why they're selling it. So how are you confident that you're buying a short-term rental from somebody who is just doing it and you could be successful if they weren't? Yeah. So it, it's been interesting. Um, the, so the properties in Kissimmee that I purchased were definitely short-term rental properties um, that over the course of when the, the particular individual had purchased the property to sold the property, they had a significant amount of equity that was built up. So I think they were just trying to get out of the equity and, and kind of cash in on the equity that they had. Another thing though, like why people are like why investors are selling these properties is because they don't know how to operate the property the correct way. They don't have the right systems. It all of a sudden is like what we talked about earlier, where it's like people think it's a semi pass like it's a passive investment. It's not like if you don't have the right systems and processes in place, even from one short term rental property, you could be spending two, three, four hours a week. And it's, it's like, if your goal is to create financial independence through short-term rental investing, your goal is not to create another job for yourself. So if you're doing that and you're doing it the wrong way, you're essentially just creating an, another job for yourself that you may not enjoy. So I think it's one of those things where um, a lot of people, I think, get into short-term rental investing and then it wasn't what they thought or they didn't do their research or they didn't find somebody like me that like helped teach Hey, this is how you do it in the most efficient way. So you're not spending a bunch of time in your business communicating with with guests, all those types of things. Um, and I think that's why they get out of it. They're they're like, hey, it's not doing the numbers. My time's worth too much to like not cash flow or cash flow like a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks a month, whatever it might be. And they're like, hey, I'm gonna check out and and like sell the property. My my personal thing is like if it's the right property with the right amenities and the right location, then I'm able to cash. I, I feel very confident going in and being able to cash flow that property based off the numbers that I ran for that particular market. So I have a lot of confidence in myself as an operator setting up the property and creating a great guest experience. And for that, um, I believe regardless of uh, who owned it previously and why they're selling, if it has the right things and it kind of checks all the boxes on my side, I know I can get the property property um, operating to the level that I want it to operate to for the for the long term. I've mentioned I'm not fully immersed in the short term rental space yet. I've been doing it a little bit with my own place, but I haven't bought a, a dedicated short term rental yet as part of my long distance investing. 
for traditional rentals, people always ask me, do you go to your properties? And so I'm curious, do you go to your properties? Great question. I get this question uh, a lot. So I used to, and um, I used to go to my properties probably two or three times a month. And a lot of the times what I was doing and I was trying to understand and like take a step back and, and like, okay, if I'm not, if I don't want to work in the business and I don't want to go to my properties as often, what do I have to do? So I started to really understand why am I going to my properties when I do go? And what I found was the majority of times that I was going to my properties, I was replenishing supplies. So supplies being like toilet paper, um, uh, trash bags, detergent, um, uh, paper towels, those types of things. So like all the, like the basic the types of things that my cleaners, are they going to go into my supply closet, grab it, and then bring it out. And what I started to realize and it was, Hey, what if I ask my cleaner to supply this? I will pay them extra every sing- single turn to supply it, buy it, all that kind of stuff. And once I started doing that and I had my cleaners manage all of that, but I paid them an additional $5, $10 per clean, depending on the cleaner in the market, all of a sudden I was able to remove myself from going to the properties. Um, And that was big for me because I was wasting time. Like I was just driving 30, 40 minutes to go to a property and like I was there for 10 minutes and I was out. So it was like a complete waste of time for me. I was doing it and I wanted to do it because I wanted more in the experience and, and all those types of things, which are really important, especially early on. But if you set your, like now I've set my systems and processes in place where I don't go to my properties anymore, um, at, at least like on a monthly basis. I'll maybe go like once every six months or once a year to check out the property, walk the property, make sure from a cleaning standpoint, everything looks good. Make sure for like a kitchen stock and has everything that it needs. The pots and pans look good um, and things of that nature. But now I'm usually, I would say for my properties, now that my portfolio is continuing to grow, um, I'm probably going there once or twice a year. If you're only going there once or twice a year, that could be on your own vacations, right? If you want to spend exactly. a couple of days there, you go there on a vacation, check things out, et cetera. Yep, exactly. Do you go to these properties before you buy them? Do you go check them out in person before you buy them? That's the other question that I get frequently. Yeah, so um, the Smokies, it, the, the two properties that I went to in Kissimmee, um, the one property I didn't go to prior to purchasing, but my real estate agent went and did a video walkthrough of the property. So I understood, I understood the location well enough and, and like seeing a video of the property, I was able to understand, okay, what does it look like inside? How much work is it going to take to get it to the level that I need it to be in order to, um, to have it be a good short-term rental? Um, the first property I ever bought, I definitely went to because I wanted to see it. I wanted to like go into the neighborhood. I wanted to see the amenities that the the particular HOA provided. So it was really important to go there. Um, and then the two properties I bought in the Smokies, I drove up to the area and I tried to understand the area first. Um, and then um, I got, I went to, I actually went to both the properties that I ended up getting under contract. But um, it was it was interesting because the first property I got under contract like a week after I went and saw it. The second property I got in, in, uh, under contract like a month uh, after I saw it because the seller didn't like my offer and those types of things. I think when you when you first buy when you buy your first short term rental, it's important to go to the go to the area and understand the area. Because it needs to be a nice area. It needs to it needs to feel safe for guests if they're coming in from out of town and and they want to have a safe environment. It needs to feel safe. So I, I think it's really really important to go to the area. I don't think it's necessarily as important to um, go in the property as long as you have a video walkthrough or you really understand from the pictures that the pictures do a really good job of of showing the inside of the property and you can understand the layout of the property, what it looks like inside. There's no like weird quirky things about it. That's, that's really, really important. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's, it's uh, necessary to go to every single property before purchasing it. Talk to us a bit about the financing options for buying short-term rentals. I'm not super familiar with them, but I know that there are some differences and some benefits to buying short-term rentals 
over long-term rentals for financing options. So talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, it's one of the, it's one of the cool uniqueness uh, factors and, and exciting things about short-term rental investing versus your traditional long-term. So there's something called a 10% down second home loan that you can get. Um, and there's a couple uh, really cool things about that loan in particular. The first is it's 10% down, which you're not going to get for a traditional investment property. Um, you can do 15% down conventional loans, um, paying PMI, but you can't do a 10% down um, loan. That's a normal conventional loan. If it's a if it's a secondary vacation home, then you can do 10%. So the cash out of pocket could be significantly less. The limitations, there are a couple limitations of that. One is you can only have one vacation home per market. That's like, because if the uh, lenders and, and from their standpoint, they're like, hey, you can't have two vacation homes within a small area of each other. Like, why would you need two vacation homes uh, in the Smokies, whatever? So that's like the first limitation. The second limitation is it has to be, and this is like general guidelines. There's no like hard and strict rules on this, but it has to be uh, more than 60 minutes away from your primary residence. If it's within 60 minutes of your primary residence, why would you need a vacation home loan? And that's how the lenders and and, uh, underwriters look at it. So it has to be um, greater than 60 minutes, generally speaking, from your primary residence. Um, and and like a, another cool thing about the the vacation home loan, ten percent down, is the interest rate that you get on that loan versus a traditional um, long term rental investment property. So you have different tiers of interest rates for loans. The lowest tier you're you're going to get is a primary residence because it's it's seen as the least risky investment. So. Your primary residence is, is going to be the lowest here as a, a percentage uh, interest percent that you're going to get on the loan. The second lowest tier is the second home vacation home loan. So that's going to be usually like a quarter point higher than a primary residence. And then the next tier up is a, a traditional investment property. So that's another cool, unique thing about short-term rentals and, and doing a 10% down vacation home loan is the interest rate that you're going to get on that loan is actually going to be uh, less than that of um, a primary or a uh, your typical long-term uh, investment property. The only downside of that of putting less than twenty percent down is you are going to pay PMI. So that's part of like the, that's one of the downsides. But how I look at it, how I view it, is okay. What's cash on cash return going to look like? Because if I'm able to. Uh, pay $150 a month, whatever the PMI may be, but I'm able to come to the table with like twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 less cash out of pocket up front, then that $150 a month when I know it's going to cash flow and I'm adding that to my PITI when, I'm, when I run my numbers, I'm going to pay that $150, whatever it might be all day long because that just saved me forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 up front that I no longer have to come to the table um, at the closing table too, and, and wire the money for. So there's pros and cons to um, the 10% down vacation home loan, but it's a, it's a super unique, very niche thing that not a ton of people know about. My philosophy with the PMI and even like wholesaler fees is that if other people can get their, their money and get their own cut while I can still make money, then that's fine. You know, like maybe I can make a little extra per month or like if you're buying from a wholesaler, sure, maybe somebody's going to make five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 off it. But if the numbers still work really well for you as an investor, why does it matter that somebody else is making some money off it too? I guess it's just this abundance mindset, but that's how I'll, I've always thought about PMI. And also think of it from like a payback period perspective of like, if you can come to the deal with $40,000 less because you're getting 10% down instead of 20%. How long does it take for that 40,000 to get repaid from $200 a month of PMI? You know, kind of do that calculation, but for me it's really just that abundance mindset like I know it's not a person getting the PMI money every month, it's an entity, but still everybody can get their own cut as long as you're still doing well. That I mean that's my my philosophy. I think a lot of people, it, you're spot on. I think a lot of people look at that and interest as like it, it's it's very much how real estate investors kind of look at uh, like rent where it's like, oh, you're just throwing money away. And people that are renting that don't want to buy, 
are like, oh, well, that's just money you're never going to get back. So like, why would you like, why would you be okay with paying $150 a month for, for whatever? But you're hundred percent right. It's like, okay, yes, but also understand if this property is going to cash flow after paying that money, then I'm winning. Like, I, like I'm winning this deal. So uh, people just look at it completely wrong. But it's that shift in, in mindset and, and frame of mind that people have to do um, and, and kind of just be taught it. Um, and, and they'll, they'll realize that like, oh, it's actually not that bad of a deal. What do the lenders have for definition of a market? You mentioned you can only have one property in, in each market for the loan. That has to be 60 minutes away. But what is the definition of a market? Yeah, I would say those definitions are very loose. <laughs> uh, so it, you just have to talk to your lender and, and they'll ask you all the questions for, okay, what properties do you own? What are your mortgages? What are the locations? Um, I don't know what specific criteria that they use to be able to, to like say, okay, yep, we can underwrite that as a 10% down vacation home loan. Um, and, and what I was saying earlier is like that even that 60 minutes from your primary residence, like that's a very loose, like it's a very loose definition right now. Um, so in the tax code or, or whatever, like it, it doesn't really have a, it has to be like from point A to address one to address two, it has to be over this distance or the driving distance has to be over this distance. Um, so like the, the guidelines are kind of like loose, but I would say talk to whatever lender that you want to get the loan with um, and they'll be able to to help you understand whether or not you would qualify for uh, for that loan vehicle. How are they underwriting these loans? Are they underwriting it like you're purchasing a primary residence, basically only on yeah. your income and DTI, and they're not considering the income from the property at all? That's correct. Um, well, that's correct in my experience. So I'm super fortunate in the sense of like my DTI is still allowing me to qualify for these loans, even if they didn't produce any income at all. So the lenders I'm using are looking at that and saying, okay, you're still able to qualify. So everything looks good. No issues on, on our side. Um, there are some lenders that will qualify the income of the property potentially. Um, you, you do need to talk through that with them just to make sure that, that they're on board with qualifying that income for the property specifically. If you, show the numbers that you ran, how you ran the numbers and, and why you feel that those numbers are conservative. Um, but I fortunately haven't had to qualify any income from a property to be able to qualify for the loan itself. How are you screening your renters for your short-term rentals? Great question. So it, it is, I do, I have a couple different, I kind of have like a decision tree of, of what I go through when I screen, screen guests. The first one is if you if you are have five star ratings from other hosts and you're recommended, you can automatically book. There's no reason for me to screen you. Again, I'm not trying to create another job. If you have a five star review from another host and you're recommended, I'm gonna take their word for it and hope that you're a good guest and treat my property well. So that's like kind of kind of like if you have five star reviews, you're gonna get accepted. You're automatically able to book. So you don't have to inquire. If you don't have any reviews, there's a couple of things that I do in, in a process that I make sure that I have. If you have reviews, but you're not five stars, I'll read the reviews and, and understand like, why did you not get five stars? It's not always going to be super clear, but if you don't have five stars, it's definitely a red flag. I've accepted people that had a 4.5 star rating because as a host, I know it takes one four star review where all of a sudden you're, you're a 4.5 rating or whatever, if you don't have a lot of reviews. So I'm not necessarily saying I won't accept you as a, as a guest at one of my properties, but I look at the reviews and understand, is there any red flags that they're calling out specifically for cleanliness, communication, following house rules? If, if they break any of those rules, and I could tell that from the review that the host left, I won't accept the guest. And, and I have no issues letting them know like, hey, I don't feel comfortable with this reservation. I hope you're able to find another property in that area uh, and have a great day, more or less. Like that's, that's my communication to them. The next thing is if they don't have any reviews and there's essentially two different ways I look at it. If they don't have any reviews and they just created the account this month or within the last two months, it's the first red flag. I accept plenty of guests that have a brand new account um, with no reviews, but I go through a different screening process where um, essentially I ask them, hey, it looks like you're new to Airbnb. 
Um, I see you don't have any reviews. Have you stayed in a Airbnb before? I try to ask a very probing question and leave it open-ended to them to like answer however you want to answer. I'm trying to gain an understanding of have they stayed in the Airbnb before? So if they have and they don't have any reviews, it's kind of a red flag because hosts generally will give a review to a guest if they left their property in good shape and there was good communication and all those types of things. Um, so that's, that's generally a red flag. I'll ask additional probing questions of what brings you to the area. Um, also, if they haven't stayed in Airbnb, I make sure to ask them, do you understand what the Airbnb experience is like and what to expect? Because that's really, really important is like setting clear expectations with your guests, especially for people that haven't stayed at a short terminal before, because it's not a hotel. The experience is entirely different than that of a hotel. You're typically going to have a full kitchen, private bedrooms, bathrooms, um, and some like the kitchen's going to be fully stocked, those types of things. So you want to make sure you level set expectations for your guests, especially if they've never stayed at, uh, stayed at an Airbnb before. So like, that's like one path I'd go down for new guests who just create an account that don't have any reviews. If they've created an account, don't have any reviews and they count like created four or five years ago, that's when I start to ask a lot more questions because that's an immediate red flag of like, if they have an account that, that has, if they have an Airbnb account or, or VRBO, whatever, that has been there for four or five years, but they don't have any reviews. And they tell me that they've stayed in an Airbnb before. I'll still ask them to begin, hey, have you stayed in an Airbnb before? If they say yes, that's a, that's a big red flag because as a host, I'm not going to leave a review for a guest if they were a bad guest, because when I leave a review on a guest, it prompts them to leave a review for me. So if I don't think they're going to leave me a five-star review, I won't leave a review for them because I don't want Airbnb pinging them and notifying them, hey, your host left your review, go and leave a review of your experience because I don't want to, I don't want a four, three, two, one star, um, one star review from a guest. So if they stayed at properties and don't have any reviews, and that particular guest has had an account for four or five years, that's a, that's a big red flag. If you're not comfortable with the reservation, you can always decline it. You're, you're the individual um, who has the ability, like you have the ability to let people in or not. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable at any point, you can decline the guest. But that's kind of the high level. That's kind of like the screening process and like how I go through determining what questions to ask. One of the most used words as part of your screening process was reviews. And as somebody who's part partially involved with Airbnb, I know how important reviews are. How do you get more of them from past renters? I've had 10 people stay in my property and I think four or five left reviews. I don't know if that's above average or about average, but you know, I feel like the other five or six, they all had great experience. They're all great guests. I let, I even left them a review, but they didn't leave a review for me. So I'm curious, how do you go about getting your renters to actually leave a review? This is a question I get a lot because I think, uh, I think the industry standard is around like 40 or 50% of guests who leave reviews. Um, there's something very specific that I do in the process of uh, my messaging sequence to guests. Um, that I, I believe is a big reason why I'm around 80, 90% of guests leave reviews on, on my properties. And the percentage that don't leave reviews are the ones where I don't leave a review of them because they didn't give any communication during their stay. So I don't know if they had a good stay or not. And, and like, I'm always nervous about leaving them a review before they, if they leave me a review, then I'll go ahead and leave them one as well. Um, but I think a big reason is the messaging sequence that I have for um, from the time they book to the the day before the night before checkout uh, or the night of checkout and then um, the message that I send to them after they leave and that's probably the biggest kind of secret sauce of, of getting good reviews um, is I have a very specific message that I send to guests an hour after the scheduled checkout time for that guest and what that message says uh, high level, I, I don't know, like specifically, like what it says high level is like, thank you for, so much for staying at my uh, Airbnb. You should have a five-star review from us on your account that was left. We would love if you uh, left a five-star review of our place and, and explain like the experience and all the great things about what you experienced for your stay. 
if there's anything that you think can, uh, the property can improve on, uh, just in general, pre please privately message me any of the feedback because we want to continue to create better experience for future guests. And we know the only way to do that is to continuously ask for feedback um, for how we can uh, improve the property over time. So I think that that's like first part of that message an hour after they leave of like, hey, we just left you a five-star review on your account. Um, we would love if you like the best way to recognize us and allow us to be able to host more great guests like you is through leaving us a five-star review of your um, of your stay uh, and then letting them know we also want feedback. Like give us feedback privately. If there's anything that you saw that we can improve on the property or anything that just like, hey, you probably didn't know this because your cleaners didn't recognize it or whatever. Uh, we want that feedback and we want to continuously get this property better. It doesn't always work. Like I, I would say 80% of the time, it, it'll work in getting a, a guest to review, not necessarily a five-star review, but getting a guest to review. Um, and that's kind of the process that I go through to uh, try to get reviews. Since reviews are so important with short-term rentals, I've heard of some short-term rental property owners trying to kind of manufacture reviews in that they'll rent their properties to people they know for like mm. a very discounted rate for like a dollar or five dollars a night or something very very cheap and just ask them to leave great reviews for them and i mean i could definitely see how that would be a strategy that would work i mean you'll, you'll have a lot more reviews which would be very helpful for for future renters is that something that's kind of like against airbnb's rules is that a process that you wouldn't go through like walk us through your thought process on that yeah, so in Airbnb's terms and conditions, that's directly in violation with their rules of allowing for somebody to book at a significantly discounted price that is somebody that you know to leave you a five star review or, or whatever it might be. So, like, if I don't know what Airbnb does if, if they catch it, I don't advocate doing it by any means. All your reviews should be from legitimate people that you don't know uh, and are staying at your, your property. Now, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to ask for somebody that you know, family members, friends, to go stay at your place, but not book it through Airbnb, but go stay at the property and give you feedback on, hey, here's what we saw, here's what we experienced, here's what what you need to do from our standpoint to make the property better. But you can charge them on the side, but not go through Airbnb or VRBO to get a like a review of the property. Um, but that like what you, what you essentially said of like offering a dollar, two dollars or whatever for somebody that you know to book on Airbnb, quote unquote, and leave you a five star review that is directly against Airbnb's policies and guidelines. So I, I definitely don't advocate doing that, but I do advocate having friends, family, whoever go to your property and stay there, not booking through Airbnb, but go and stay there and give you feedback of before you have guests, your first guest or whatever it might be so that you can understand and get feedback from somebody uh, on like, hey, here's what I would do on the property specifically. There are a bunch more talking points that I want to talk through. I want to talk about some of the common rules you have. I want to talk about the different platforms, insurance, cleaners, automating, photos, I mean, recessions. There's so many more things I want to talk about. So we're going to have to have you back on the show, Travis, soon to, to finish the second half of this conversation. For those that have enjoyed this episode, tell everybody where the best place is to find you. Yeah, the best way to find me is on Instagram um, at the young retiree by 33. Uh, and that's where I'm, I'm most responsive and, and uh, the best place to reach out to me. I'll be sure to put a link to Travis's profile in the show notes below for anybody that's interested. You can also check out people that I follow. Travis is one of the few people that I do follow as well. So you could find him there if that's an easier way for you. Travis, thanks so much for joining me. Robert, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.